Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm Florian, um, and I want to talk a little bit about, um, about two things. And I know this talk was titled Play, but I've expanded on it a little bit, and, and you'll see in a second how. Uh, and this is the last talk I'm going to do for a while because I've been, I don't know, I feel I've been doing these too much. So it was kind of nice because I could sort of look at what sort of connects all the different dots in our work. And, and I think one thing that occurred to me a while ago is that, that for me to move on in my work and to be able to sort of move on in general, I need to acknowledge the present. You know, I, I can't just be sort of focusing on the future or the past. I need to, I need to exist in, in the present. And, and that means that you have to be present. And it also means that you have to look at everything that you see with an open mind and with open eyes and not immediately attach sort of the, the labels that you're taught to attach to everything. You know, that's a chair and, you know, that's a lamp. And in that respect, I kind of, I kind of want to challenge Carsten's thing a little bit about language, you know, about sort of the end of language being the limit of your world. I think, I think language can limit your world as well. I don't know who said it, but someone said that if you, if you tell a child that that flower is called a rose, it'll never see that flower again, because from then on, it'll only be that rose. And, uh, and you know, I, I think what, what I want to do is, is just sort of look at things as if I was seeing them for the first time, and then sort of opening up the possibilities, because for me, then, reality becomes negotiable to an extent. And I'm going to explain sort of what I, what I mean by that. Um, and I really want to propose two ideas, the first one being that um, the mundane can be beautiful and magical and surprising. And the second one is that sometimes it's better to be stupid uh, and to not know what you're doing and to just play. Um, but I want to go back to the first stupid thing I did, which was in 1999 when I moved from, from Frankfurt to London. Um, and I, I didn't go because I had a job there. Um, in fact, I wasn't even looking for a job. I just kind of went because I wanted to be in London and I didn't want to be in Frankfurt anymore. And for anyone who's been to Frankfurt, you'll probably understand what I mean. Um, but, you know, I think what happens is when you come to a new city and you're kind of coming there with sort of an open mind, you have to get into gear and you have to act and you have to think and you have to see things differently. Um, and I think one of the most powerful things for us was was just sort of starting a lot of sentences with what if. And we, I remember we made a list of, you know, what if we did this and this and this and this. And, you know, the first thing that we did was um, what if we made a website? Now, neither me nor my partner had any clue how to make a website. My background is in film, her was, hers was in, in fine art. Um, but, you know, it seemed, like, it seemed like an interesting thing to sort of combine the things that we were doing separately in, in one thing. Now, I don't know, some of you might remember, but 1999, 2000 wasn't necessarily the best time to move into the website-making business because really sort of the dot-com bubble was bursting in front of our eyes and, and really this sort of this new medium was just failing so miserably. But we thought, you know, within all these ruins, you know, we could propose a different idea. And what we proposed was, was this thing called Soulbath. And, and this was as much about us learning, um, learning Flash. We produced the site within the 30-day window that we had from the trial version. Um, but we also, I'm not kidding, we actually did. But it was also about, you know, it was kind of like a comment on, on things that were failing online. And, and we love stuff that doesn't work, you know, like when stoplights don't work, you know, then you have to think and you have to be alive. So, you know, like the site sort of kept throwing up sort of weird sort of error messages that had an interface that was basically unusable. Where other sites were flat, we wanted to propose depth and we wanted to play and we just asked questions, for example, you know, if you had a lonely computer, what would it play? Um, and we came up with a non-interactive single player version of Pong. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it was, it was sort of all things like that. Um, but we thought, you know, why don't we expand it a little bit further um, to the banner? You know, and the banner is like this dreaded advertising space. And we wanted to propose something that wasn't about consumerism. Um, so we made an open call to people to fill that space with an idea or an emotion or, you know, with some sort of visual disobedience like, like this stuff. Uh, which I think is really beautiful. And, you know, it was just sort of taking that space and just messing with it. Um, 
Now, this was all, you know, we did all of this from our bedroom. Um, and, you know, here's, here's a few of those banners. There's, there's one from Josh Davis. Uh, there's uh, some from Adbusters. Um, you know, some really, really, one from Soda. Um, some really interesting stuff, but we know what we never anticipated was that this would get any traction anywhere. We just did it because it felt like something we wanted to do. So um, suddenly we had a half-page article in the New York Times about this because it did sort of hit, um, hit a sore point, I guess. And, and the next thing would happen is that a young director who was just finishing his second film came to us, and he saw parallels within this, the sort of decay and the falling apart uh, of the site um, between that and, and the film that he was just making. Um, and he asked us, would you be interested in making a website for my film? So we watched the film. Um, and after the film, we asked ourselves, what if we made a website fall apart? What if we made a site that the longer you stay on it, the more it breaks apart, until in the end, it literally just kicks you out? Because the film was dealing with addiction and, and decay and dependency. Um, and the film goes from summer to fall and to winter. So we wanted to mirror that in the site, to have a sort of multi-threaded narrative that always ends in the same place. So it starts off sort of white and promising, um, and then you get to fall, and in the end, you get to winter and everything falls apart. So there's lots of different paths that you can take through this. Uh, this, this is one of them, just sort of visualized basically from, from start to finish, and there's probably about 10 different ways that you can go through the site. Um, and just so you know roughly what it's like, um, here's a video. This is kind of a high-speed run through, through one avenue within the site. Um, but you know what, what we wanted to do is sort of take some really mundane things that you know, everyone knows, like image missing icons, and, and proposing a new language out of those. Um, same goes for all the websites that we sort of messed up. Um, and you know, this whole idea of taking mundane stuff, you know, stuff that you expect to work in a certain way, and then messing with it and surprising you, became such a good principle that at one point we proposed it to um, one of our clients as a guiding principle for what they asked us to do. And, and their question to us was, can you design a style guide for people who don't read style guides? Um, and we are like, well, we can try. Um, so we were looking for something that not so much told you which font to use and which color and, and where to place stuff and how big the logo should be and how much space should be around it, but rather something that inspires you to create your own things. And we thought, you know, what if we hijack reality? What if we took reality and we add one thing to it and suddenly it becomes something different? So this is the stuff that went out. Um, I, it's, it was for MTV uh, International. Um, and uh, one thing I can tell you is post-2001, sending out a box that has the word hijack on it to 120 different people, not a good idea. Um, but, you know, so those were all different elements of the style guide. So it, it came with uh, lots of stickers, it came with stencils, uh, it came with spray cans, it had t-shirts in it, it had all kinds of th things in it. And the heart of it was a book. Um, so this book starts off as a Swedish science book, uh, and then sort of we start out crossing, crossing words out until only the ones that you want to read are left. And the idea was that, you know, where, where others read no entry, we just cross the first bit out and we just say try. And we've got Justin Timberlake working as an accountant. Um, so it was this whole idea of taking different elements and just messing with them until sort of like in the middle of the book, the book is actually hijacked 
by another book. Um, and it became such a, it, it became so much fun for us to work on this, actually. We produced so many elements that in the end, we thought it'd be nice to do a digital version of this as well. So we produced this, which was kind of a weird um, mixture between Windows XP or 2000 and Mac OS X, um, which, yeah, I mean, we just kind of like messed with all these different things. This is true in life. Um, so it was, you know, it was kind of like this and like that. So we had like all these different texts that we had to put into it. And so we thought, what if we take something like Word and we just mess with it a little bit by doing that? Uh, and actually, so that's, I think, the first lines from Ice Ice Baby that it actually has. And then the whole interface was actually hand drawn, but it's fully functional. So, you know, you could like scroll through the whole document, highlight stuff, uh, obviously download it. Uh, we had some more stuff that we had to put in. Um, so we decided to do the same thing with, with Excel as well. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, you know this, this whole idea of taking stuff that you use every day that you don't even question, that, you know, it's, it's almost like just almost invisible, to sort of mess with that and try and do something interesting with it just became something that we were really, really keen on. Uh, and one day, we asked ourselves, what, what if we did this to the almost most visible yet invisible thing that there is, which is Google, you know? Um, so, you know, this, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transition to somewhere else. You don't think about this. Um, and I worked on this with um, the really talented Mr. Doob, who worked for us for a while. Um, and we came up with this idea, which was, why don't we sort of make this a playful space? And why can we not disintegrate that? And I, I showed this at TED last week, so that's why it says TED Athens here. But, you know, taking something that is really just a tool, something where you go, type something in, hit enter, and it takes you somewhere into a space that you want to actually spend some time with because you have a, you have a reason to play with it. So these kind of ideas sort of kept sort of running around our head, and you know, they became such a guiding principle for our work that after a while we sort of thought, you know, this, this idea of playing with sort of mundane things, but also this idea that I mentioned earlier of trying to remain stupid, you know, not really know what you're doing, um, made us think, why, why don't we make our own eternal deep end, you know, something where we can endlessly jump in and learn new things and kind of scare ourselves and surprise ourselves. So we started a company that's called Nanika, which um, I run with uh, our longtime uh, collaborator and friend, Andreas Müller. And Nanika is sort of there to, like I said, to scare ourselves and to do things that, you know, previously we wouldn't be able to do because no one was asking for it. Um, so the first thing we did is actually, um, I'm going to show you a video, it's, it's something we did for a phone company. And, and this actually we found afterwards, but it's, it's very much relevant. Now we live in an, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots <laughs> that don't care because this is what people are like now. They got their phone, and they're like, ugh, it won't. Give it a second. <laughs> give it, it's going to space. Can you give it a second to get back from space? Is the speed of light true? Yeah. Yeah. So we found that so true. You know, like I remember when I had my first mobile phone many years ago, this idea that I could be sitting on a beach and I could call someone in a taxi 2,000 miles away and be able to converse with them totally blew my mind. You know, I thought this was, this is the most magical thing ever. This, I don't even want to know how this works. And, you know, fast forward, what, you know, 15, 20 years, I, you know, this is my phone, it's on silent, and I kind of, I don't want to answer it most of the time, and it's become this nuisance, it's like, ugh, you know. And, and at the same time, you take it to bed with you and you take it everywhere. Uh, you know, people get nomophobia when they don't have their phone on them. Um, so we're thinking, you know, what if, we, what if we bring some of that magic back to the phone in the most simple way with the most simple tool there is? And, you know, one of the most simple things after making calls, which, which obviously, you know, like, like this one isn't actually very good at, um, is, is text messaging. So we thought, what if we took a text message and we allowed you to send that text message to a specific number in a store, and then we transformed that message into something that you couldn't actually have um, done yourself. So it becomes just a bunch of different fish that swim around. 
And in the end, it looks something like this, and you have all these different messages swimming, swimming through the store. So this, you know, in working with, uh, with this particular company, we, we developed quite a few of these things where, you know, it was, it was much more about bringing a little bit of magic back to the phone. It wasn't about selling the phone itself. So this is, this is a project that I did with Andreas. Uh, well, Andreas did all the hard work. Um, I just made the gradient in the background. Uh, <laughs> And one, one thing that he did is, you know, it's another what if, and it's, it's based on this idea, what if computers could dream? And I, I, really, I really love this project. It's, it's so clever, yet so simple. Um, he read somewhere that um, the Earth smiles in flowers, um, meaning, you know, flowers are the most beautiful things that the Earth produces. Um, and he thought, you know, if, if computers could dream and I could help them to dream, um, what would they be dreaming of? So he has this, uh, he created this piece which is called Hana, and it basically creates flowers completely out of code. There's no, there's not a single bitmap in it. There's, well, there's one bitmap which is the name of the piece, but everything else is created in code and it just sort of regenerates itself endlessly. And the idea obviously being that, you know, there couldn't be any bitmaps involved. And I think what I, what I love the most about it, mo most about it is that for this to be actually really sort of um, method, if you want, I wouldn't even be able to show you this. It would just run on the computer and no one would ever see it. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's one of those beautiful projects that you kind of can only do when you don't have to worry about clients. Um, and then the next thing, the next what if I want to show you is, um, you know, building your own North Star. And it's, again, you know, it's something about, you know, just having an idea and jumping in and not sort of thinking about what you can do, you know, what your knowledge level is in terms of technology, but just, going, okay, let's, let's try this. And it's built on the idea that wherever you are in the world, there's always another place out there that is important to you. And this could be the place where you were born, it could be the place where your parents live. Um, and the idea was to create a lamp that um, you could actually train on a, on a certain direction, you know, like let's say, uh, you know, northeast. I don't know if this is northeast. Um, and if you turn it toward that direction, it would actually become brighter. And if you turn it away, it becomes darker. And, you know, just imagine, like, I, I travel a lot, you know, for my kids to have that lamp that every time they turn it on, they have an idea where I am in the world is really beautiful. So, you know, the way you go about it is that you, you do stuff like that, and then you see the lamp in the background, which sort of turns on. And the final result, really, um, is this, which is called Lamp North. Um, it's a very sort of simple shape. And here's a video that kind of shows you how it works. It, it's kind of hard to capture, obviously, but yeah. So if it turns towards us, it actually gets quite a lot brighter. It looks like it's bright all the way through. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's good to sort of do stuff that just scares you a little bit and that you don't quite know how to do. You know, how do you manufacture this? How, how does any of this work? Um, I think one of the more scary things we did was, was taking this whole thing and applying it to a live setting. Um, and we did this two years ago uh, when we did visuals for, um, I don't know if the band, yeah, like these people down there. They're a band called Kasabian. I have no idea who they are, but um, a lot of other people do. And, and they sort of, uh, <laughs> um, and we worked with uh, a bunch of other people um, on, on creating interactive visuals. And what I love so much about it is that this, you know, is another project where it's not about selling something. You know, the people already bought the ticket. If they just stand there and someone turns the lights on them and they just play, everyone there is going to be happy. But they wanted to give more to people. They wanted to give them an experience that would stay with them for a long time. So, you know, again, we sort of started working with stuff that we've been doing in the past, uh, you know, stuff that we just played around with. Um, and then we started applying it to live visuals from, um, from the concerts and sort of seeing what we might get out of this is a very simple, just sort of like um, black and white, well, grayscale map um, that uh, basically extrudes these, um, these lines. And then the end in the concert, it looked something like that. So there's a bunch of different things that we did. Um, this, is, this is one of them. Um, I can show you a little bit of this, but I might scroll through it. Sorry, the sound is absolutely appalling. So basically, the uh, what happens is that the I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Uh, 
the guy's backstage and he walks, we've got a camera on him and then he walks on stage and you sort of just see him as this, as this black and white outline. We tried a bunch of different things for this, um, but I think one of the most, I'm gonna skip this, one of the most beautiful ones is also one of the simplest ones, uh, which is for their last song that they play, uh, which is called Lost Souls Forever. And the idea was that um, we wanted to connect all these different souls in the audience. You know, some of them might be connected already, some of them might actually be lost souls, and you sort of connect them to someone else. So we created this um, piece where it's really simple. We just sort of train a camera on the audience, um, and then we do basic face detection, and we draw a circle around uh, all the faces we can detect. We put soul on it, and then we connect them with a line. And it's, you know, it's, it's so brutally simple. And then you know, every 10 or 20 seconds, we took a picture of it, and that was posted on Facebook, and then people could tag themselves. Um, <laughs> But I guess what it showed us was that um, people really like, sorry, I'm going to turn this down a little bit. People love seeing themselves big. I mean, it's, that's uh, eternally true. But people love this kind of interaction so much that, you know, I'm going to just go forward a little bit. Even long after the band had left, sometimes this would be running for another 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and still sort of connecting all these different dots and still taking snapshots of it. Um, and you can see, you know, we're like quite a bit in, still running. Um, so once we did that, um, we decided to make that a little bit harder still and to actually use those kind of visuals um, with a live dance performance. This is something that we did for a piece that um, was in, um, in Beijing. Um, and I'm just going to show you sort of a few, a few images. So it was a mixture between um, videos that we'd sort of basically pre-rendered, and then we had um, a multi-touch interface where we added live interaction as this was happening. And I, I, I don't think we got the final choreography until about a week before this actually happened. I think we had four weeks in total to do it. So again, you know, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's one of those things where your mind says, no way, we're not going to do this. This is way too risky. But I think the sort of child in you sort of goes, oh, this would be fun. You know, why don't we, why don't we try this out? Um, so you know, these, these are some of the pre-recorded things that we did. Um, and this is a short video of what it actually looked like in the end. There's only so much violin one can take, so I'm going to turn this down a little bit. <laughs> um, but you know, sort of staying on, on the same line of sort of scaring yourself and sort of doing stuff that a you have no idea of doing, and that is kind of something that you shouldn't be doing as well. Uh, we asked ourselves, you know, what if we resuscitated print? And that is a stupid idea because you know print is dead. Everyone knows. Um, but we thought. Um, why don't we make a magazine? Now, this is probably one of the most stupid things you can do because magazines are notoriously difficult to keep afloat. And, and to be honest, um, this is the magazine we did. It's called Style Zeitgeist. Um, and uh, we're just working on the fifth uh, volume of it. And that's probably going to be the last because we have basically burned through all the money there was. Um, but it's still worth doing, you know, because A, it's, it's something that we haven't done before and that I was always curious about, you know. Um, not, not just, you know, in terms of technically how would I print a magazine, but also how would you structure it and what would having my own magazine allow me to do. And it's, you know, it's not just my magazine, it's actually run out of New York um, by a friend of mine. 
But you know, we we were able to do sort of things that um, other magazines couldn't do. There's there's hardly any advertising in it. Um, I think the new issue basically has no advertising at all in it. But it allowed us to do sort of like 24-page articles about um, people making a shoe in Italy, uh, basically from where they get the leather, how they treat the leather. Um, so it's you know it's all about you know it's looking at fashion and, and culture and, and lifestyle in the broadest sense um, from an angle that no one else really looks at it. Um, so you know I would say um, I wouldn't do it again, but you know at the same time it was definitely definitely worth doing, um, if only just for the fun we had while doing all these different things. Um, but staying on print um, or you know like the sort of very ephemeral version of print. Um, that you get in an email. Um, one thing that we're working on currently, and this is totally not finished at all, um, but I thought it was relevant um, because it was, again, you know, it was about taking something that was very mundane that you don't really pay attention to, which is, you know, emails that you get from clients, um, and creating something tactile out of them. Like, the idea was, you know, what if I could touch an email? What if, you know, what would that look like if it was an object? Um, and what we did is we just took different emails that our clients sent us. Uh, this is actually something that we wanted to send out for Christmas, but you know it's not worked out, so they're going to get it in January. And when I say January, I mean February. Um, <laughs> but you know, so we we took these and we mapped them onto we mapped every single letter of the email onto onto these spheres, and then we sort of applied sort of a, a weight gradient to them so that there'd be bigger and more letters at the bottom to give it a heavy base, and then it would sort of expose the structure of the sphere towards the top. And also sort of still, you know, for people still to be able to read some of these sentences. Um, and we deliberately took sort of quite a vi variety of different things. You know, some, some of them are just people that wrote like, oh, this is beautiful. I love it. Thank you. And the other one, uh, another one that I had was, uh, I think it's probably this one here, uh, something like, this is not the kind of quality I expect from a company like you. I'm very disappointed. So it just becomes this sort of black ball of anger that the client sent you. But then I was like, okay, what if, uh, what if we took that and we actually made it into a precious thing again? And this is, this is a failed attempt, but I still want to show it, uh, by actually applying gold leaf to it. So, you know, it's this sort of angry email that becomes an object, and it's kind of like, like the dark soul, but then you sort of make it sort of really valuable and beautiful again by applying gold to it. So we do all of these different things. Um, and a lot of them with the intention of, of staying a little bit stupid, you know, of trying something we haven't tried before. You know, 3D printing, we had no idea what would work. It took forever to actually find the right sort of depth for these letters to actually be able to print it. Um, but my biggest fear is that, you know, what if I become an expert? This is really my biggest fear. You know, one day I'll be this expert that knows what he's doing. And I say that because I think if you know what you're doing, there's a chance that you're only going to do what you know. And this, for me, is sort of the end of creativity, and, and this is where I would want to bow out. So it's, it's really about sort of, you know, what can I do to sort of retain this sort of level of stupidity and naivety? And I think one of them is, is to sort of play and to also provide a place where, you know, that's conducive to play. So this is, uh, these are sort of shots of our studio, and it's, it's a mess because, it's a mess because we use it. Um, we use it as a photo studio. Uh, we use it to store junk from many, many years ago, like this first Apple computer that we got. Uh, we've got a CNC machine here, which uh, you know we used probably once or twice, but you know we tried it. Um, this I have no idea why that's there. Um, I think I think Andreas just wanted to own an SGI, and he bought it. I don't I don't even know if it works. Uh, speaking of Andreas, that's that's his desk, and you know I think messiness is great. You know I think if you have sort of clean desks and everything is nice and tidy, and it goes totally against me being German, but you know I I love messy desks, and this is this is behind my desk, and again you know sort of allowing people to play. We we've got lots of instruments in the office, and a lot of people that work for us are actually musicians, and and we sort of want people to play. So this is this is more of my stuff, and I've got one guy who's actually managed. To hook all of these different things up, this is this is an old Cork MS20 from the 70s, and he somehow managed to get that to listen to MIDI uh, on pitch and everything. Um, 
We now, I actually haven't got a photo of this, but we now started using the back of the studio as a skateboard um, place. Uh, so every, almost every night after work, people start skateboarding, they're building their own ramps and everything. Um, and you know, we, we constantly sort of buy stuff that gets us excited, you know, a bit like, you know, a bit like kids. So we bought this drone, um, and this is sort of, oh yeah, Jägermeister, very important. Uh, so this is, the, this is kind of like a flight through the studio, the, the first one as well, so that's why it's a little bit shaky. Um, yeah, and apparently not a lot of people are working there. But you know, it's sort of, you know, it's just sort of kind of like a, a fun thing to sort of like, you know, have all these different things and, and to be able to play with them. And, and one, one other surface that we have in the studio is, is this one, um, which is in our kitchen, and it's basically just sort of a big blackboard, which we just use to you know, draw silly crap like that. Um, and then at one point we thought, what, you know, what if we took that space and actually offered it to other people to fill it with their own stuff? And um, thus the, the kitchen project was born, which is something that we did for a year. Uh, and we invited lots of different artists to come and basically fill the space. Uh, and some actually went all out and sort of filled the whole kitchen because all of it is it's black. Um, like uh, Sally sort of print, just put this everywhere. Um, then Mariko Marika just sort of basically took one of the things that they found in the studio, which is sort of a, a poster that says, uh, fail better. And they created this piece out of it. Um, for other people that literally just sort of Dropped in the door and said, "Can I can I draw on your wall?" And they and they did these things, which I really love. Um, and this is a guy from uh, Berlin, uh, going under the name of Atsum, uh, and he created this. This is this was absolutely insane because it was all vectors that he had somehow put together and then transferred them onto the wall. With you know, it, this took him you know almost three full days to do this. So you know that's that's one way of sort of you know keeping yourself interested is by playing and by offering surfaces for play. Um, but really, like for me, the most exciting thing um, is if I could manage to see like a child again. You know, this I think you know you talk to a lot of people, and this you know this seems to be the consensus. You know, being able to see the world through the eyes of a child would be amazing. And uh, obviously, you know, I'm in my 40s now, so that, that's difficult. But I found the solution, which is having your own kids. So I made my own, and uh, <laughs> I see the world through their eyes now. So this is, uh, I, I urge you all, no, I don't urge you. Have, you know, have kids if you want to, but you don't have to. But it's amazing, because, because it shows you things like this. You know, they have no, there's no real context. You know, this, my son, this could be a day, you know? So he could be Buzz Lightyear in the morning, and then he could be this sort of self-made stormtrooper, and then, the evil emperor um, sort of later in the afternoon, because he doesn't have to be anything, you know, he can be whatever he wants to be. And that also extends to the stuff that they play with and how they play with it. Um, so this, um, this is something um, I'm probably gonna have to talk to them at some point about, because yeah, I bought them Itchy and Scratchy toys. They have absolutely no clue who Itchy and Scratchy are. And I've got a feeling I'm gonna be paying for therapy at some point. Um, but because they don't know who they are, they just dress them up as Bulgarian folklore dancers or whatever, you know. It's kind of, to them it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference because they just, they don't look at it. And this is going back to what I said earlier about, you know, once you give something a name, once you call that flower a rose, it'll forever be a rose. It'll never just be this wondrous thing that comes out of the ground again. So, the one thing they really taught me is, is looking up. And this is such a simple exercise that I use every day uh, in my work, in my life. Um, this is a tree close to my house. I've walked past this tree many, many years. And it wasn't until my daughter was in a, in a stroller and she turned around and said, look, Daddy's shoes. And I looked up and I saw that there's tons of shoes in this tree. I mean, there's only two pairs here, but there's at least 10 pairs at any time in that tree. I, I have no idea what exactly it means. Apparently, it's some gang-related thing. Great neighborhood. Um, but you know, once you sort of like get into that mode, because we're so focused on just sort of walking through the world like this, you know, and, and you forget about this whole thing that lies between A and B. You know, you forget about everything that's in between. And there's this, there's this one thing that Alan Watts said where um, he said that, you know, everyone thinks that life is this serious thing with a serious purpose and a beginning and an end 
when really it's a musical thing and you're supposed to sing and dance along while the music is playing. So I've started looking up and then, you know, this isn't an editing suite. I found this. Um, it was on the wall. It was a pretty high wall. And it's beautiful. Um, another one of my favorite pictures is, is this, which is a wall at Schiphol Airport that goes absolutely nowhere. It's a super heavy door. I have no idea what it's for because you can literally just walk around it on either side. But you know, you just sort of suddenly see these bizarre little things or you see funny little things like this Arsenal fan. <laughs> but you know, if you, if you look back, it's something that everyone's done. You know, the, we've, we've all done these things. And there's a very, very simple exercise, which is just looking at the sky. So these pictures were taken about a minute apart from each other. So on the left, and you know, I'm open to other suggestions. I think it's uh, Pluto or Goofy, I'm not quite sure. Uh, then this is the dragon from the never ending story. I forgot what his name is in the middle. And then there's a horse's head on the right. And it's such a simple exercise to do, just to sort of do this. And it, I think when I started doing it again, it sort of brought back all these other things that I remember as a child. And I think, the essential truth that I found out of this is that it's really not what you look at, it's, it's what you see that counts. And I think if you, if you do this long enough and, and thoroughly enough, one day, like me, you're going to make a pancake that looks like Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> and maybe you're even going to notice it before you eat it. Thank you very much.